yes, you can get blossoming of a subarachnoid, but the blossoming of a subarachnoid can be deferred if you are smart, direct, and adept. Herniation occurs because of increased intracranial pressure. There's no wonder there, right? Um, it's something that we all know, I think, at a rudimentary level. What might be relatively interesting is that there are different types of herniations that can occur due to raised intracranial pressure. The most mild is uncle herniation, and that's why in a lot of radiology reports, we hear about impending uncle herniation, but have a relatively normal GCS, because uncle herniation is just a little bit of pressure on the brain that's oftentimes subclinical. So I do believe that this herniation exists. I don't think that the radiologist is overcalling. But I think that, you know, we're seeing a GCS of 14 or 15, and we're like, it's impossible that he's herniated. That's because that's just the start of the cycle. Central herniation is what you see next, and that's when you have bulging of your ventricles a little bit. Uh, Transcalibrarial is when you see brain matter coming out, like the first couple of pictures that I showed you for penetrating trauma. Transtentorial will not cause a blunt pupil first. Transtentorial will cause a massive headache, diminished level of consciousness first. And that's what you see with epidurals, right? You see a massive headache, it just won't stop. Not a thunderclap headache, but a massive growing gnawing headache. And then you see them start to like slur speech, have a motor deficit, and while you're going to scan, they blow pupil. You then have your upward herniations and your tonsillary herniations, which are very, very bad. Epidural hematomas are probably the best way to demonstrate a herniation because they're very fast, because they're radial artery bleeds for all intents and purposes in the brain. They're big named vessel bleeds. By far the first sign of a very bad prognosis is a blown pupil. And once you've had a blown pupil, it might be too late to act. It's because the difference between an intracranial volume where you don't have a blown pupil and one where you do is based on an elastance curve. And once you've hit the limits of the elastance curve, your intracranial pressure will go from 20 to 80 with a very small amount of volume change, about 20% change in volume. And in an epidural hematoma, that translates to time and a rate of bleeding. And I would contend that you can't wait on this. You have to act early in some way. There has to be something that you do. And the reason why is because you have only 20% of the time from when the epidural hematoma started to prevent this patient's death. Now, how do we measure ICP? And why do we measure ICP? We measure ICP because it is the only, the only thing that can prognosticate for us once your patient is in the ICU. Whereas in the initial CT scan, we have other markers that tell us whether this guy's going to survive or not. In the ICU, by far, the most important marker is raised ICP on either CT scan findings or on other methods of measuring. This is because the Monroe-Kelly principle dictates that once you have a slight rise in the ICP, your venous congestion begins to become less. Your, your, your venous side of your circulation in the brain gets pushed out. Then your CSF gets pushed out. As this occurs, your brain needs CSF to be able, and the venous side, to be able to feed the nerve cells. As that occurs and the mass effect occurs, you're choking off the nerve cells, you're creating an anaerobic cascade that's creating more edema and tissue factor release that's making things more coagulopathic. As that reaches its extremes and the mass effect compresses further, your brain gets pushed out before your arterial volume gets pushed out. And that leads to a decompensated brain. Because of this, we tend to emphasize a lot on ICP. Now, intracranial pressure monitoring can happen with fiber optic catheters, epidural transcranial catheters, Codman lines, which are catheters that sit on the top of the brain in the uh, epidural space or ventriculostomy catheters, external ventricular drains. How many of you, has anybody here put in an external ventricular drain? If you have put in an external ventricular drain, I will praise you. And anybody who knows me knows that I do not lay on praise lightly, right? Has anybody done that? If you have, please mention it in the chat. Okay. Yep, an EVD. Has anybody put one in? Badr Shaban, I praise you, sir. I have praised you before, I think, but I praise you twice now. Badr Shaban, I praise you twice. So external ventricular drains are like the chest tubes of the brain. They are both diagnostic and therapeutic. They are pretty much essential. The problem, and the reason why we don't have them in Kuwait is, 
because external ventricular drains, uh, many of you put one in, I praise you too, but not that much, just a little bit. The reason why external ventricular drains are important is because like chest tubes, they're both diagnostic and therapeutic. The problem that we have locally here is that we're not trained to put them in and we're not trained to take care of them very well. And if you have a ventriculitis in the context of a brain bleed, your mortality is extremely high. The reason why they're important is because the waveform off of them will tell you how compliant the brain is even after a craniectomy. The second reason is because they allow you to drain and temporize intracranial pressure. And the third reason is because they allow for dynamic ICP monitoring and reduce the number of CT scans that you need to do, which reduces the reasons to move the patient in and out. These reasons have translated to a mortality benefit of about 10%, but have not translated to a survival to leaving the hospital benefit. So patients do better, but they don't leave the hospital necessarily. Unfortunately, in Kuwait, our best test for this is a CT scan. And the reason why is because there are lots of things that you can see on the CT scan that tell you when the patient's ICP is elevated to a point where they will be doing badly. One of the first things is a complete lack of the fourth ventricle, as you can see here. Next, you have complete effacement of the cerebellar sulci and gyri. You have a slight congestion of the third ventricle because that area is more pliable. It's above the tentorium. And then you have what we call poor gray white matter differentiation. Poor gray white matter differentiation occurs across the brain globally as the perfusion goes down. And it looks like this. The one on the left, the gray white matter and the white matter look almost the same. The one on the right, you can see a difference between the gray and the white matter. Both of these patients have brain traumas, obviously. There's a bit of edema. But the one on the left is too far gone. There is no longer any cerebral perfusion, unfortunately. Whereas the one on the right, there is some cerebral perfusion left, and you should begin to address it urgently. This is because you're trying to prevent secondary brain insults. So not all neurological damage occurs in from the initial insult. Secondary brain insults occur because of a lack of optimized cerebral perfusion, in addition to a lack of ability for us to be able to feed CSF and oxygen into the brain. So the brain gets most of its oxygen from the arterial side, but gets most of its nutrients from the CSF. It also lets out its content, its toxins through the CSF. So the CSF is both TPN and the kidney for the brain. There's very little that you can do to, to correct intracranial content. It's because whatever's in the brain is basically CSF, water, solid mass, and intravascular blood. We cannot correct the solid mass, so forget it. I can't like do a partial lobectomy and hope that there's a good out outcome there. We've done it a couple of times in our service. We have had patients get discharged, but they've had things like hemiplegias happen, epileptiform disorders, et cetera. You can, and you can do it as part of damage control surgery, certainly, right? Um, if you want, I can talk about damage control brain surgery at any time. It's about a one hour talk. You can augment water using hypertonic hyperosmolar therapy. You can augment cerebral spinal fluid using dialysis catheters, but it's very experimental. And you can perform intracranial dialysis for that, but it's very experimental. And you can deal with intravascular blood volumes in order to augment cerebral blood flow arterial oxygen content, and metabolic rates. We use cerebral blood flow to augment cerebral perfusion pressure and increase oxygenation. As a rule of thumb, cerebral perfusion pressure is MAP minus ICP. And the best, quote unquote, cerebral perfusion pressure varies between 50 and 70 and is augmented based on that. However, there is a caveat. If you go beyond a certain systolic blood pressure, there is a vasoconstrictive effect that unless you have a raised ICP that you're trying to overcome, will eventually lead to a problem in terms of ischemia. So it's very important for you to understand. If you do not have a pathology that you're addressing, and if you do not have proof of a high ICP, and you're using a high riding mean arterial pressure, such as 90, you may not be doing your patient any favors. The word may is very important here. And it, it's because the literature has equipoise. There is a very good Brazilian study that has proven that a map of 90 has some benefit, but in those cases, they only do one CT brain and they don't have ICP monitored. In many centers, we do a second CT brain if we have a deterioration level of consciousness or if we have higher ICP. 
overall, hyperosmolar therapy is far more beneficial. And overall, hyperosmolar therapy has been one of the biggest drivers in non-operative management of brain injuries. Our targets are two things, sodium and osmolarity. We want a sodium that's between 145 and 150 milliosmoles per liter, and we want an osmolarity of between 300 and 320. Our tools at the trade are a mantle of 0.25 to 1 gram per kilogram per kg, given every four hours to target, and 3% uh, saline uh, being given uh, at 150 cc aliquots for target. My cocktail for this has been to alternate between the two in four hourly intervals and hold it off once I've hit target on intervals. Now, there is some data from animal models that you can use 23% uh, saline or 7.5% saline as a resuscitative fluid. And this data comes from a kooky idea that we should be doing this if we're on the field. Do not believe this data. Do not inject 23% saline into somebody. And the reason why is because once you've injected 23% saline in 30 ml aliquots, you're going to suck all of the interstitial fluid out of their uh, organs. It's not cool, like it's, it's almost toxicological, right? Your strategy should include maintaining the systolic blood pressure above 90, but not necessarily a map of 90. To optimize your PO2 so that it's 60 uh, milligrams or sat above 90, um, sorry, millimeters of mercury or sat above 90. To have an ICP monitoring of some sorts, especially if your GCS is below eight. Uh, to treat the ICP if it's above 20. To give mannitol and hypertonics judiciously, and hopefully that will save lives and to optimize your cerebral perfusion between 50 and 70. Hyperventilation is not recommended unless you're using it as a bridge. The reason why is because it doesn't really work. It kind of works transiently. Feed them early, and phenytoin is only effective in treating seizures in the early stages, but not as a prophylaxis in later stages. Steroids will kill a patient. Medium, steroids will kill a patient. Do not give steroids in the acute stage. I warned you I would bring this up. Annie told me. Question six. So let's talk about this hypothetical. Another 27-year-old patient comes in hypotensive tachycardic. You begin an MTP. Um, they have a multi-compartment hemorrhage with midline shift and brain edema. Your best strategy is to give normal saline to help resuscitate the patient, give Lasix to reduce the vascular volume and reduce the edema and bleed to give hypertonic saline or to give mannitol first? Which of these would you give first? Please answer in the chat. So again, quite debatable. So very, very interesting, very debatable. So this is one of those things where there's no equipoise, but let's talk about strategy. So in trauma, it's all about strategy. If I have a patient and I'm running normal vanilla ATLS and they're not a responder, they're not a responder, giving normal saline as a bridge to blood and then giving blood would be very, very good. Giving Lasix would be very, very bad no matter what. Giving hypertonic saline would increase your intravascular volume by sequestering more fluid and at the same time would have some neuroprotective effect. Giving mannitol might drop the pressure to the point where you cannot perfuse the brain anymore. So if you're not giving vasopressors and if you have a chance of active bleeding, your first line should probably be hypertonic saline in the trauma. And certainly, in, uh, I know in Shock Baltimore now, they give hypertonics first and hemodynamically unstable. Uh, in the Shock Manual, I think it says that too now. Uh, the Trauma Brain Foundation guidelines hasn't gone strongly either way because they have to reach equipoise and consensus. But also in most of the other manuals for local institutions, I think Jackson as well, they go hypertonic saline first in the trauma brain. Now, you see this patient the next day and you've done a PAN scan for them, and you see that they are normal tensive tachycardic, but their base deficit is minus five, their hemoglobin is eight, and they're on levofed of like 10, or 
uh, eight and Kuwaiti numbers. And uh, your PAN scan has shown a grade three splenic injury. What do you do with this patient? Do you give them normal saline to try and get them off of vasopressors? Uh, do you go to angio? Uh, do you do a laparotomy or do you give blood? So I'm seeing a lot of people who want to go for a laparotomy, a lot of people who want to give a trial of blood, and uh, a lot of people, more people want to go for a laparotomy. Wow, you guys are cutters. This is amazing. Uh, you know, yeah, we're talking about a little bit of people giving blood. The blood pressure, but the Shaban, the blood pressure is stable on levofed with a base deficit of minus five. I'm waiting for Bela Shaiban to respond because uh, I think having an attending's opinion is very interesting. We should start having debates on this too, but so um, stable on levofed. Okay, so interesting. So there are certain parts of this that are not debatable. You cannot just give blood at this point because you're outside the 24-hour window. They've already failed that. Okay. Giving normal saline will not help anybody. Laparotomy versus angio. In centers where the trauma has been dealt with exclusively by anesthesia and emergency medicine trauma team leaders, they've tended to go for angio. In centers where they've had it being dealt with exclusively by surgeons, they tended to go for laparotomy. In centers that are hybridized where group decisions are made, they've tended to go for laparotomies as well. So if you look at intention to treat, for the most part, people are doing laparotomies for these cases. What's also interesting is that going to angio on levofed with a brain injury in the National Trauma Data Bank has shown extremely poor outcomes. So it is no longer debatable if you look at extrapolated data. The evidence strongly suggests that if you're on vasopressors and you have a base deficit that is deviated with an abdominal pathology, you address the abdominal pathology using surgical steel. You operate on the patients. And so there is no equipoise in reality. Stable on levo is a misnomer. I have only heard this in Kuwait. If you are on levo fed, you are not stable you are de by definition unstable. You might be made unstable because we want to deplete you intravascularly to preserve your brain, but we shouldn't be doing that if you have an abdominal pathology. So stable on level does not exist. And that's why that question is there. It's one of my pet peeves. I get very annoyed by it. Post-traumatic seizures, the vast majority occur within the first seven days of injury. If they require any pharmacological, any surgical therapy, sorry, after seven days, they mainly require pharmacological therapy. Risk factors include a GCS less than 10 on arrival, a cortical contusion, depressed skull fracture, any type of hematoma, and a penetrating head wound. Basically, all of our patients in trauma. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough because I recently had a transfer that was started on steroids for a headache and did not do so well. Steroids, the only level one evidence in traumatic brain injury is that steroids are bad. All right? Do not give steroids. Now, lastly, I'm gonna talk about the role of surgery very briefly. The indications and the role of surgery. So there hasn't been a consensus statement since 1991. And this consensus statement uh, has not been revised until recently. There is a newer guideline that has been based on military data. And in general, if you have an acute subdural hematoma and you have a five millimeter midline shift, clinical evidence of a raised ICP, an unevaluable patient with an ICP that's elevated on CT or on monitoring, or if you have a 10 millimeter thickness or greater, you should be doing a decompressive craniectomy urgently. Surgical evacuation to subdural hematoma should be occurring urgently because you can save the patient's life with an excellent functional outcome. Four, parenchymal injuries that are subarachnoids or subdurals that show a contusion that's greater than 20 centimeters squared or a midline shift greater than five millimeters on the CT scan, they should be treated urgently. And the reason why is because your decompressive craniectomy can save the patient's life and lead to less of a neurological deficit 
if the patient leaves the hospital. Bifrontal decompressive craniectomies are not good options anymore in the literature because of landmark studies, but they are included in this guideline. Bear in mind that this guideline has not been updated in 10 years. In patients with posterior fossa bleeds, if you can operate on them within the first hour, and if they came in with a favorable GCS, their survival rate improves. And whenever you operate on these patients, they bleed a lot. They bleed significantly. Okay. It's very bad. They bleed a lot. There is usually a lot of torrential bleeding. And if there's any piece of advice I can give you, it comes from my alma mater, McGill. And it's not really advice, it's a really good paper, where we looked at our time to craniectomy and its influence on outcomes in risk stratified patients. For the same patient, no matter what their prognosis is, good, bad, or awful prognosis, GCS of three or GCS of 15. If I take them to the CT scan within an hour, and then from the CT scan to the OR within 40 minutes, their outcomes are double as good. I would say that everybody should read that paper. I don't have time to talk about it today because of time constraints, but everybody should read that paper. And remember, work right, work smart, and work fast, and do a CT scan post-op. In summary, if you are not going to be doing the craniectomy, optimize your blood pressure to a systolic above 90. Optimize your oxygenation. If your GCS is below 8, you need to do a repeat CT scan or monitor the ICP in a different way. Treat the ICP if it's above 20 or you have evidence of any form of cranial compression. Manitol and hypertonics are your tools. Cerebral perfusion pressure should be between 50 and 70. Hyperventilation doesn't really work. Feed early. Phenytoin only works late. Surgery works early. And steroids will cause harm and TBI. I've kind of done my best to cover everything. I think that I've covered classification, initial management, base of skull fractures, any types of other types of injuries, and high ICPs. Remember, if there's anything that you should take out of this, I know I talk very quickly and there's lots of stuff here. I'm gonna try and give you all copies of this presentation. It'll be on my own podcast as well. And I think that they have a YouTube channel. Somebody who looks like this should get the workup that they deserve. Do not give up on them. Shave their heads, prepare them for the OR, do your CT scan. And if you look at the CT, this patient will walk out of the hospital. I, I, I get very annoyed when people tell me that something that looks like this is poor prognosis. His brain was barely touched. If you do a craniectomy for him, he will walk out of the hospital. And this patient did walk out of the hospital, right? Just a preview for part two. Part two will be a lot of cool soft tissue injuries, things like this things like this, and things like this. There'll be a lot more cases. There'll be a lot more fun, I hope. If you have any questions, uh, I'm gonna open it up, uh, type them in. And thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Lulua, for putting up with me, only doing this five minutes ago. Uh, the team here are excellent. They're very accommodating to a very busy schedule. And if you're not bored yet, I have a whole bunch of other content on my podcast. Screenshot this and put it on.